We're here this afternoon with Chris Bidell from the GGF to talk about Part L and Part F of the building regulations. But before we get into that, uh, I just want to talk about the, the change in title, Chris. You were membership of FENSA, and you now have this very grand title of Head of Advocacy and Stakeholder Relations. Would you talk us through that? Hi, Chris. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I've had a bit of a change. So um, in December last year, I uh, took on this new role of Head of Government Advocacy and Stakeholder Relations. Um, it's a key role, really, because we've got to keep talking to industry. Uh, the GGF is 45 years old and it's been doing a, a grand old job. Um, but we need to make sure that government is listening to us and other stakeholders too, uh, so that we represent the best interests of our members. Um, but you're quite right, I was with FENSA, which is a group company for five years as the head of membership and uh, seen a lot of change in the industry and thoroughly enjoyed my time and uh, really excited about this new role. And uh, say I've only been in it a couple of months now, but uh, starting to move things forward and uh, meet with government. Um, a really good example, actually, is um, on Monday uh, we attended a meeting with Lee Rowley MP, who's the Under Secretary of State for Industry, to discuss GGF's approach to apprenticeships. And that was a really, really good meeting um, hosted by the NHIC. So this government connection means that you won't be very long before you're invited to a party at number 10, I suspect. <laughs> well, I think we've got a way to go, but really it's about establishing ourselves and making sure that we're the consultee of choice. We've got huge amounts of information as an industry, as I said, 45 years old uh, as GGF. So we've amassed a lot of information here. And so when government is thinking about policy or change, then you know we want to be the people that they want to come and talk to, to make sure they've got all of the background and information that's important to them to make those critical decisions. It's probably quite a good move, isn't it? Because you've obviously got the experience within the GGF and to have that direct connection with government. Because in the past, you've had other companies who've kind of interfaced, haven't you, between the GGF and the government, whereas now you're doing it direct through yourself. That's right. You know, we've worked with various public affairs businesses in the past, and we may continue to in the future. But um, establishing our own relationships is really, really important. Can I just ask, who's taken on the membership role then from yourself, or are you still involved in that? I'm still a director of FENSA, actually, but the role has been taken on by Liz Clark, who you may be aware of. So she looks after the BFRC business and her title is now head of UCAS regulated businesses. So she now looks after BFRC and FENSA. Right. Well, let's talk about Part L, if we can. Uh, and probably to start with, can we just explain? I'll just read it off. From what I understand, it's a, all about a reduction in maximum new values from windows in new builds from 1.4 to 1.2, moving towards a more radical target of 0.8 for new build over the next five years. And in existing homes, a reduction from 1.6 to 1.4 in windows and from 1.8 to 1.4 in doors. Is that your understanding of it? Yes, I believe so. I haven't double checked those numbers, but they, they look about right. So essentially, the, the U value reduces and at the same time, the window and door energy ratings increase. So um, the, the U values come down towards one and the window and door energy ratings are on an A, A to sort of G scale. So it's like you'd see with your white goods, you know, if you're buying a, a TV or a fridge or something, you've got that rainbow rating. So the window energy ratings are getting closer to A and then they go A plus and A plus plus. And at the same time, the U values come down. So it, 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 it corresponds. It's the same sort of thing, but it's, it's two different ways of calculating something very similar. I mean, is it enough? Because, I mean, the government is talking about reducing it by, what, 75 to 80 percent by 2025. Are we going far enough with those ratings that they're talking about now in order to catch up enough for 2025 for targets? Well, it's an interesting point, actually, and it's something that we've been heavily involved in. Uh, we wrote something called the GGF Glazing Guide to Net Zero, which was launched in December last year um, with Bob Blackman, MP, um, coming along to the launch. 
And the GGF has set out the principles upon which it can, uh, the glazing industry can help government achieve the targets that they're looking for. But we know that insulating the existing buildings to emit less carbon is the biggest challenge we face. And to reach the government's net zero targets, since 24% of a building's heat energy can escape via inefficient windows and doors. But there's been some major step forward. Um, first of all, back in 2002, the confident person schemes, so they came into effect and have been very, very successful. We've got performance ratings now of windows and doors, as I mentioned with BFRC, which is, uh, you know, again, something which is widely used. So the industry has really stepped up to meet the challenges by investing millions of pounds in the manufacture and development of energy efficient windows and doors. And these are ranged from low emissivity glass, smart glass, vacuum glass, uh, triple glazing, and sustainable framing materials. So we've been doing a lot over quite a number of years to actually get to this point, and it hasn't stopped. So the developments continue. And it's not just about the improving the uh, energy efficiency, it's all about the life cycle of the products as well. So something we've been keen to do in GGF is set up recycling programs. And we've got a very exciting program uh, at the moment, just limited to PVCU windows and doors, but hopefully it will expand in the future, which is a take back policy as well to stop uh, materials going into landfill. But based on the um, installation register, registration figures that we have since 2002, Fenza alone has um, managed 15 million installations, which is about 65 million windows and doors that have gone in since that scheme came in. But in simple terms, there's about 28 million homes and there's about 13 million that don't have energy efficient glazing, uh, which will increase fuel poverty on low income households. In addition to we calculate emitting 9 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere each year. So these are scary numbers you'll see. But there are ways and means that the industry can certainly help government. And we're very pleased to engage with them to put a program together. But it will require a lot of their help too. Now, D-Day for the regulations is, what, 15th of June. But I'm hearing within the industry that some people are thinking that there's going to be a cooling off period uh, after that time. But surely 15th of June is the date. I mean, the cooling off period has been now, hasn't it, from, from Christmas up to this point. So what are people thinking here? It's a bit of a worry. I think there is great concern in the industry, and probably rightly so, because... Uh, the transition period isn't very long. It's literally six months. And a lot of companies may have to invest in new machinery, retooling, training staff, you name it, design work. And that's a very short period in which to do that. But also what we must also consider is that uh, with the lead times on windows and doors, um, windows and doors were being sold in December when the regulations broke for installation after the 15th of June this year. Right which means that uh, you know, there are contracts out there now that potentially could be non-compliant. So our understanding at the moment, we are having regular discussions with government and making sure that we put the industry's case forward is that we would like either a deferment until such time as various issues can get sorted or certainly a much longer transition period, maybe until December. There is a precedent for this, which happened when Part L was first introduced. But um, what I do have to say is that the last meeting I have had with government, they are very firm on the 15th of June being the deadline. And until such time as they say anything different, we must work towards that date. Wow, that, that's quite something, isn't it? If at least there is discussion going on, which is kind of healthy, uh, but I hadn't really anticipated you saying that about long contracts that have been booked from December and then being in operation after June. It's a big issue then. It can be a big issue and obviously something which we're very much aware of and has been brought to our attention. And that's why it's really important for us to get in front of senior civil servants and talk to ministers where we can uh, to state the case of the industry, because the way we work has to be understood at all levels. And um, whilst changes um, are made and we've talked about Partel and the introduction of more energy efficient windows and doors, which is a good thing. You know, it's how these are rolled out and the transition periods which really matter to the industry at large. So that's what we're doing. We're in, in regular contact with government and we're putting forward the views of the industry very strongly. I mean, do you think that the, the changes have been properly communicated to the industry? Uh, 
has enough been done in, on that side? Well, when the documents first came out, it was the 15th of December, and they take some reading. So uh, you've probably looked at them yourself. Um, they are complicated and technical documents. And they're written in such a way that you do have to sit down and really, really take a good look at them and work through them to understand um, exactly what they mean and what the changes are. So that's taken a little bit of time to do. But um, in the new year, the GGF and Fensif both came out with um, information to their memberships about the changes, where to find the documents and the, the likely interpretations of them, which is really important. So the documents, as they are published, stand. Um, but there are some conversations going on at the moment to consider background ventilation, especially in Part F, and whether there are any industry solutions or uh, additional test information which we can provide to government on top of what they already have, which will help with a better interpretation of where trickle vents are and are required. Yeah, I mean, that I was going to come <laughs> on to that because there's definitely a conflict, isn't there, between Part L and Part F? Uh, and indeed, I mean, I've got this written down, but Housing Minister Eddie Hughes said the changes will significantly improve the energy efficiency of the buildings where we live, work and spend our free time and are an important step on our country's journey towards a cleaner, greener built environment. But surely Part F works against Part L. It's absolutely clear, Chris, that there is a contradiction. Um, in one hand, we're looking at increasing the energy efficiency of our homes, which is obviously very good and something we all should be doing and considering. Um, but then you've got part F1 uh, to do with domestic dwellings. And what that's basically saying is taking your energy efficient windows and punching holes in them for background ventilation. So there is definitely a contradiction there and that's not been lost in the communications that the industry has had with government about this. Um, to put this into context, the government calculates the average home will require about 900 kilowatts um, of extra heating uh, per year. The GGF calculations put that slightly higher, but at the end of the day, we're talking hundreds of pounds, um, which will be required for you know, ordinary working families. And there are a lot of people out there, as we know, it's all over the, the TV and the news at the moment. There are a lot of people in fuel poverty and struggling to pay their bills. Sorry, can I just get that straight, Chris? Are you saying then that it'll cost extra money, those hundreds of pounds, to heat a home because you have part F ventilation? Yes, that's correct. You're basically putting openings in windows and doors. So on one hand, we're making them more energy efficient, and then on the other hand, we're putting um, punching holes in them for trickle vents. And the, the trickle vents that are in the regulations are, are bigger in terms of surface area than the yeah. previous regulations as well. So what happens when a homeowner says, look, I really don't want these trickle vents in my frames. If he's talking to a bona fide installer, the installer is going to say, presumably, sorry, but that's the regulation you have to have them. Does this open the door for the cowboy installer who will actually say, yeah, OK, I won't bother getting uh, trickle vents put into your windows? But then there's a conflict, isn't there, when it comes to meeting the building regulations or when they sell the house down the line and the solicitor says, hold on a minute, your windows are not compliant. Yeah, quite right, Chris. Uh, we did some surveys of our membership last year, and it was quite clear that the, the overwhelming majority uh, weren't in favour of trickle vents because their customers don't actually want them. And it's a behavioural thing in many ways, because uh, if you put vents in windows, it doesn't necessarily mean that people will open them. And in some cases, we've seen that they're taped up um, because they're drafty and they can lead to you know, cold rooms. So it's all about the behaviour of the individuals, the homeowners and the tenants within the building as to how successful triple vents really are at the end of the day. But um, the other thing is that uh, to consider that um, the example that you gave there, you know, could drive installers into the grey economy. Um, yeah. Because if so someone's going to fit them at the end of the day, if someone says, I don't want trickle vents, at the end of the day, there will always be someone who will fit windows without them. And that's yeah. unfortunate. And that's why we're talking to government and, and engaging with them at the moment to put across these really important points. Because if you're working the grey economy because you don't want to fit trickle vents, 
there's a good chance you're not fitting safety glass or fire regress hinges, making the installations potentially quite dangerous. And then there's also the other requirements as well. So the installation practices may not be in line with health and safety requirements, such as working from height, which we know can lead to accidents. So there's, there's quite a lot around this piece at the moment. And uh, the grey economy is something that um, you know, government and regulators should be concerned about. Given the success that we've had of the confident person schemes, you know, over the last 20 years, and don't forget, you know, Fenzer is, is, is 20 years old in, I think it's the 1st of April of this year. So, you know, an important milestone and a lot has been achieved and we don't want to undo that good. I mean, is the policing good enough to actually spot the problems with Part F? I mean, you can only inspect a certain proportion, can't you, of installations. Does this mean that you're going to have to ramp up the amount of policing that you do? Not necessarily, because the scheme is based around competency. So when we go out and assess companies, we're, we're assessing their competency to do the work, but also their underlying knowledge of the building regulations and other relevant documents as well. So the installer will know where there's a situation where uh, background ventilation is needed and what type of ventilation and how it should be installed. So um, it's not true to say that it's required in all cases. There will be certain exemptions in certain areas, uh, conservation, etc. Um, but in the main, what the regulations are saying is if you have trickle vents now, then you must replace them. If you don't have trickle vents, then the new windows that have been in should be ventilated or to use another accepted method. And what we're really challenging at the moment and working with government on to provide solutions is what the interpretation of this really means. And if there's an opportunity to put forward information and data to show that actually replacing, say, PVCU to PVCU double glazed, uh, double seal windows won't actually change the air permeability or the air tightness of the building. Therefore, it could be a like for like situation. And some of those types of words are used in the regulations, and that's why we're working hard with government to get a, a full uh, interpretation of what that really means, so that we can make sure that everyone fully understands their obligations. But as they stand at the moment, as I described, um, that is what is written, and that's what will be required from the 15th of June as we stand. And I suppose we've got to ask, is the industry really ready for the 15th of June? Um, you know, zero carbon, the government are looking to achieve by 2050. We have to be ready, presumably, for the 15th of June and keep moving forward. We, we do. We do. And, you know, this is the first step on the road to, you know, potentially more change. So the building regs are reviewed every few years. So it's always possible that the, the, the values will reduce, the energy ratings will increase to make our homes more energy efficient. Um, so, you know, it's really important that um, we understand the regulations as they're written, and they do need to be written in simple, plain English as well. Again, something which we've been at great uh, uh, odds to actually point out that, you know, the, the documents need to be uh, simple to understand and simple to use. And if they are and they're written in that way, then they're much easier to, to pick up and work with. So, yeah, this is an ongoing conversation, really. Um, we're still providing... Uh, important technical data and information to government to help them underpin the decisions and to uh, and to, to see some of the background information that we have and it, only yesterday we were able to provide a number of test reports uh, which looked at windows before and after aging tests to demonstrate to government that there's very little degradation of those windows over that uh, aging period now that's been a really useful uh, piece of work that GGF you know has put forward to government because there are all sorts of assumptions that if you're taking out windows you're taking them out because they're drafty and leaky and replacing them with something better um, but that's not necessarily the case and that's what this data actually proves is that you may be taking them out but then they haven't degraded to that point and a lot of people change windows and doors for aesthetic reasons noise attenuation safety security uh, all manner of reasons why they, they change them out and not just because they seem to be uh, leaky and drafty. So, um, you know, the research, the information that we have, you know, it's really important to impart that to the decision makers so they fully understand uh, the contribution that windows and doors can make, uh, not just now, but in the future. 
Well, it's only, what, three, four months before all this takes place on the 15th of June. Are you going to be ramping up how you're talking to the industry and making sure that people understand what is going on and that they're prepared for it? I mean, are you going to do that with advertising or training or and, and how does the, the public know about it? I suppose that's going to be the next question, because all these installers will be talking to the homeowner who is going to be ignorant, really, of the fact that they have to have trickle vents. Yeah, I mean, the, the change brings brings about a number of, of issues and opportunity as well. So we mentioned that 13 million homes, you know, could could uh, benefit from energy efficient windows. So we reckon that's about 100 million windows and about 20 million doors. And over the next five to 10 years, if that change was to take place, it would put government, you know, well on the road to achieving some of the milestones and targets they've put forward. And hence why the glazing route to net zero report is such an important document. If, draws a line in the sand as to exactly where the industry is and how it can help uh, move the dial. Um, and to do this, the glazing industry needs the support government across many areas. So, you know, consumer incentives, policy changes, awareness campaigns, and, you know, importantly, addressing the skill shortage. I mentioned earlier that we met with the minister on Monday to talk about apprenticeships. So, it's not just one thing. There are many, many um, issues that we're talking to government and other stakeholders about on a very regular basis that need to come together to really help us move forward. In terms of information that has been provided, yes, information um, uh, has been published so far, but there's a lot more planned. So I should think, um, you know, you'll see in the near future webinars and also some further training as well. So I just encourage anyone to keep the lookout on that websites um, on our portals for information which we'll be sending through. Chris Bidell, Head of Advocacy and Stakeholder Relations at the GGF, thank you very much for your time and for helping us understand Part L and Part F. Many thanks indeed, Chris. Thank you, Chris.